Hey again, this is Dennis, and uh, you know today it's it's something a little different because um, it's something that affects all of us, especially if you're a car person, car guy, girl. The um, and going to a couple of bigger Mopar shows in the last couple of months have really made me think about this. They basically the end of car culture in America, especially when it comes to, you know, classic performance cars. The, I'm not saying it, it's inevitable, but without a lot of change in a lot of different things, it is. And it's kind of, it's kind of scary, uh, to be quite honest. You know, this is not something that happened overnight. This is something that has, taken decades to help come about and honestly if you really think about it car shows car culture the peak was probably in the 90s and ever since then it has totally go down and there's like five main reasons that i could think of and you know there may be others or whatever but these are five really poignant ones that just go wow and when you add them together it makes what we have today which is you know car show in Ocala in November where the weather was perfect where you only have 200 cars come and 80 of them are new and that's on a Saturday you know with beautiful weather and you don't you you can't you can't get 400 cars out there or mo party where it, oh my god it might rain and you have 30 attendants and even when it's at full attendance it's not massive it's not like I remember Carlisle back in the 80s or even uh, the Atlantic Nationals, which was at Raceway Park, which had hundreds and hundreds of cars. And actually a lot of the, you know, like you'd see a Charger RT drag racing. It's not really something you see today, but I'm digressing a little bit. So the first part of this is the price of cars. And I have a little, a little chart here and then a graph starting in 1950, because that's when the post-war car culture started really coming about. All oh, this, the, the GIs were coming back. There were a lot of them in their young, to early 20s. You know, they started having money. They were used to, especially if they were pilots or if they were working on airplanes, they were used to the speed, you know, you know the, the fun. And, and they, you know, remember, they actually saw a lot of danger, so kind of get a thrill. You know, they this is when car culture truly started. And back then... You know, the minimum wage in 1950 was $1,560 total for the year. But a new car was 1500 So you can go buy a new car with just an average job. You, you didn't need to be wealthy. And a used car, you know, they, they devalued quickly. So they went back and they bought, you know, stuff from the 30s and put flatheads in them. And, you know, they only had a few hundred dollars invested in this car. And they had a hot rod. Hence the hot rod culture because there was nothing much to cheat, you know, nothing much to do this, you know, and through, you know, the sixties, you know, 60, 65, 69, which is the high water mark, where the minimum wage was still or about the same as the average car. And that's the average car, but you know, like you could go buy a roadrunner for under $3,000, especially a used one, like one that's left over 68. You aren't paying a lot for that car. And I use Mopars because I know them best, but they were deployments were the cheapest things you can buy. As you see over time, you know, in 72, and it got, this is where economics come in. You have to kind of understand economics a little bit to understand why the price of cars did what they did. There's a couple of reasons. One of the main ones was in 1972, Nixon took us off the gold standard internationally, which basically made the first oil embargo happened because they were used to receiving an ounce of, uh, you know, um, one ounce of gold for every $35 because they wanted gold, not dollars. Gold is an international trade. Oil was pegged at, I think, seven barrels for one ounce of gold. And so it was $5 a barrel and it was pegged at that. And everyone was happy. And then we got taken off gold standard to, of course, make it so we could have fiat money and $38 trillion in debt and blah, blah, blah. You know, I won't go into the full details of economics. I this is what I kind of this is what I studied in school. So I just it, it but it has a massive part on why 
this has happened because by 1990, minimum wage was $7,000, but the car was now 16000 you know, and then of course you go up to now where it's thirty-one thousand dollars. It's just fiat money, but the new car is forty-eight grand. Buying new cars now is like a, is a luxury. It is not something that you do often. It is actually now a very big deal. I notice in my own life because honestly, decent middle-class family, but honestly, I don't go buy. I mean, buy a car a decade at this point. The average average age of a car now is what twelve or thirteen years old. My charger was 13 years old when we bought it, and it was basically a used-up thing. Had no value. It was I got eight hundred dollars for it because it was really nice, and they made a good deal on a Grand Marquis. So, the price of cars in general has really helped push this along, and then the price of used cars followed that along. Of course, we had our wonderful thing in 2008, cash for clunkers, which destroyed the used car market. Almost 900,000 cars that were perfectly fine destroyed. That, that's what young people would have bought. Poorer people would have bought these cars. Who cares about the fuel economy? You had transportation. It once again proves the axiom, the nine scariest words in the English language. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So with that, used car prices are now insane. You used to buy in, in 1969, you could buy a used car for 100 bucks. R running with tires and air conditioning. Because it had it and it worked. You know, even through the 70s, my uncle used to buy cars for a couple hundred dollars and drive them and get rid of them. And they weren't that old. You know, that's the thing. The cars weren't that old and they were that cheap. Now, I'm looking at 20-year-old 3 Series, 325s, that the people want $3,000 for and they have 200,000 miles on it. And that that's just the reality of how bad it has gotten. The next part is insurance. The insurance mafia, as uh, Eric Peters calls them, uh, EP Autos, really has done a number on destroying the affordability of cars. You can't have, once again, can't have that type of insurance without the government helping them. Once again, working together, making our lives miserable. Because now a young person trying to buy a performance car, like I know in Florida, somebody wanted to buy just a Charger RT and they're under 25. It's six grand, seven grand a year in insurance just because. And, you know, this all started about 1970 with the insurance because they realized they could. And then, of course, now we add in uh, electric appliances, which don't pay much more than the average gas car. But when they get in an accident, they're totaled. So there's seventy thousand dollars that they have to pay out. You know, there is part there is cost associated with it getting more expensive because also all the other regulations for safety make things more expensive for insurance companies. Plus, the EVs don't pay any more, but man, they can destroy a lot more and then they get totaled quicker than a gas car. You can fix a gas car up to a certain point, but an EV, no. So appliances are part of the problem at this point. Honestly, there is, I don't see a solution for this unless you fix the way the insurance companies work. The third is safety. And I mean, honestly, the safety stuff has gone so overboard at this point that it, it, it is regressive in the amount of safety it's providing, but the cost it is adding to a car and then to travel is absolutely astronomical. We have airbags put in everything and they're expensive to put in, the systems you have to put around them. And then of course they age out. We don't know what's gonna happen to airbags when they're 40 years old. We really don't. We don't know if they're just going to spontaneously combust, not work at all. We don't know what happens to them. And the insurance and the auto and the automotive industry and the insurance industry don't care. So we have that problem. The cars themselves, all the safety stuff added to them, adds to the cost. Besides the money becoming worth less, now you're adding things to it. Government overreach is really the problem. It, it, it truly, it, it is truly help speed this along you know now we have speed cameras school zones everywhere you know it, the speed humps all these things that make driving miserable artificially low speed limits you know on on secondary roads the highways actually the speed limits are fine on most highways 70 75 it's perfectly fine it's what it was back in 19 in 1970 when you had cars with drum brakes 
You know, it's very safe to go that in a modern car. They stop a heck of a lot faster than an old car does. But all this safety stuff makes driving, so now we're getting to the actual person, it makes driving unfun. It makes it boring. It makes it frustrating. And it truly takes away from the experience, the fun. And this is in most parts of the country. There isn't a lot of places where you can actually go and have a nice drive every day. I know I'm near Tampa and it is miserable seven days a week, 18 hours a day. It is, there is no pleasure being anywhere in this metropolitan corridor between here and Orlando. There is no, there is no pleasure. It is absolutely horrible. Uh, the cars themselves, you know, the cars themselves, after the mid, in the 70s, they still tried. Even in the early 80s, there was still some try. Uh, but I'm going to use Chrysler as an example. After 83, Chrysler built nothing that a, a performance enthusiast would want. The Cordoba and the Murata died. That was the end of their rear-wheel drive cars that were coupes. Then you had Grand Furies, Fifth Avenues, and... Uh, um, diplomats, and they were just police cars. They were uninspired garbage. You know, this the, they were they were still powered by carburetors up until late '80s. Then they put a horrible fuel injection system on them. They weren't fast. They weren't sexy. There was nothing great about them. And you know, then they built the front wheel drive cars. I don't see them anymore. I don't I don't see the front wheel drive cars from Chrysler in the '80s and '90s anymore. They're gone. In Chrysler, just as an example, since I know this best, I mean, they had what the the, the uh, Viper, which was just an exotic, terrible car to use every day, and the Prowl, which is also a totally impractical car. There's nothing that they built that has any sustainability for car shows or cruisings. Where are all these? Where are all the LH cars? They made 300 uh, 300 uh, M's. Where are they? They're I don't see them. Where are all these, you know, the RTs that they built? They're, they're, they don't exist. So, as, as, especially for Chrysler, they have nothing after the early 80s, which makes, you know, and even that stuff, nobody really wants. And there's no sexiness with it. And your age groups that, when they were old enough to buy those cars, like they were born in 1980, they didn't want them. They went and bought a European car because it was, or an Asian car because it was cheaper, easier to drive, and it got better fuel economy, and it looked better. So that kind of, you know, right there, the cars themselves, now they're just basic jelly beans and uninspiring, and honestly, there are no cheap performance cars made in America. None. None. It, it really is amazing because the, the Charger and the Challenger, I won't consider the Charger because that's a four-door sedan, but the Challenger A, it looks old. It looked old when it was new. It's expensive. It's fat. It's heavy. And it in and honestly, the Mustang, General Motors has had the Camaro for a while, then the you know, some Cadillacs and all. But all these are very expensive cars. And honestly, your modifications that you can do on them are nowhere near what you could have done way back in 1970. So you lost that kind of the ability to make the car yours because you can't do an engine swap you can't go buy a cheap car and then go put a great engine swap in it in an american car and make it something like you could buy a 65 coronet 69 find a 440 drivetrain from a uh, from a chrysler 300 drop it in that car and now you had something that was fast and very cheap because you know you didn't pay a lot for any of that stuff so that, that, and there's no correcting that. I don't see anything fixing that at all. And of course, then the end of the hangout mentality. Now everybody does it. And this has been slowly happening over the last 25 years where people have done things less personally. And now within the last 15, 15 years of being able to do stuff over internet and do, you know, as I do stuff over internet right now, but to have communities over internet and not go out and hang out with people and also not having places to go. Because when I was, you know, first driving, you know, we used to go hang out. This is in Staten Island, you know, it's in the city, but there was the parking lots where the, all the businesses were closed at, you know, it's five o'clock or six o'clock and the deli was open and we all drove our cars there and hung out and just, you know, talked about things and whatever and showed each other's cars. And then, you know, 
If you wanted a drag race, you went someplace else. You didn't do it there. Now it's all organized cars and coffee and other things that are organized. And, uh, you know, there's always a business angle on it. And it, it's not organic. And most of the people, you know, that go to that are older. And, you know, there are younger people. I can't just blank a statement because that doesn't work. But for the most part, there's no organic, hey, we're just going to go hang out here and, you know, talk about our cars and just kind of park and go go to this place and go eat and do whatever. Especially here in Tampa, because A, the traffic can't do it during the week, and B, a lot of places just drive you away when they see like 15 cars in the lot. Because of insurance, they end up, you know, driving you away. So you can't stay there. That whole, without that, all the other stuff kind of goes with it. The car shows the the modification because now you just don't have the the camaraderie the 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 club that you used to have and honestly you know i i i don't want this to be complete you know oh my god the sky is falling and it's not hyperbolic but it's kind of fact you know as you watch for the last 25 years car shows slowly just shrink you know car meets shrink you know, the, the interest in old cars shrink where now the old cars end up getting sold to collectors, which aren't enthusiasts. They stay in museums. They come out occasionally. They don't go to shows. They don't hang out on Thursday night. Unless there's something massive or happens, if there's a development, this is, you know, pretty much the dying days. You know, my generation, maybe the generation after me, are going to be the ones that are basically going to be at the end of it. And I really feel that way right now because of what I've seen uh, just in, you know, the old car prices. They're unaffordable for anybody. I couldn't get into this hobby right now to buy, even buy my car make it, and make it a nice car like it is. I can't, I couldn't afford that. I, I honestly couldn't. And, you know, that, that's, that's, that, that, that's all just part of the economics of it. So, you know... These are my thoughts. What are yours? I mean, I, I really, I don't like making videos that seem like they're a downer, but this is kind of where we are. We're, we're at the end. And unless things, and, and honestly, nothing's going to change. I don't care who's in the White House or whatever, unless all those organizations with initials go away and manufacturers can build cars that people want and people, and, and you have more people in trades and be able to work on cars and actually it's dead. So yeah. And this has been really hard. This video has been very hard for me to do just because it's so, it's so opposite of what I am. It's so just downbeat, but there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no rainbow at the end of this. And it's sad. So once again, those are my comments. I want to hear yours. If you got some from this, Hey, like, subscribe, share. If you didn't, thank you for watching this point. And as always, just to try to keep it going, if you have a cool classic car or something fun to drive, take it out. You'll make someone's day, maybe even your own. And I'll catch you really soon.